Hello everyone, I'm Robin Walton. Sisters in Crime Australia is delighted to welcome you to our June 2020 event titled In the Dead of Winter. Now fittingly, we're recording just after the winter solstice and after dark using Zoom. And our topic is crime fiction set in really deathly cold winter and quite often in frighteningly dangerous conditions. Our guest authors are three of them. Chrissy Mean. Hello, Chrissy. Hi. Hi. Lee, Christine. Hello there. Hello. And Sarah Barry. Hello, Sarah. Hello. Right. Now, as is usual at All Sisters in Crime events, we begin with an Indigenous acknowledgement. We acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia. We recognise our continuing connection to land, waters and culture. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. Now I'll say a little bit more about our panellists. I won't say much about their books because they're going to tell you themselves in their own words, which will be far more accurate than mine. But, um, Chrissy Neen, I know most as a novelist, but you may not also know that she has published poetry, an award-winning collection and a memoir. Correct me if I say anything wrong along the way here, Chrissy. No, that's yeah. correct. Good, so far so good. She's yeah. also written and directed television documentaries for SBS and the ABC. Currently, she's developing a TV series with Stan and Screen Queensland, and is a feature film in the works with SBS and Madman Entertainment. <laughs> and <Thank she> has <laughs> time. <laughs> um, tonight, though, we're just going to focus on one little thing, which is Chrissy's novel, Wintering. I'll show you the cover in case you've not seen it before. Um, it was put out by Text Publishing, who is an Australian company, and was shortlisted last year for the Davit Awards, which is a Sisters in Crime Australia annual event where we celebrate books published in that year by, or previous year, in fact, by um, Australian women writers dealing with criminal topics. So welcome and congratulations, Chrissy, on that career so far. Thank you so much. Yeah. Now, Lee, you're going to be talking about Lee's novel, Charlotte Pass. I'll show it to you. Yeah. That's been published by Alan and Unwin and released early this year. Yes. Right. Charlotte Pass is Lee's debut crime novel. However, if you think that's all she's ever written, you're very dead wrong. She's uh, written previously at least six novels in the spectrum of um, romantic suspense and rural romance. Is that how you classify them? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, and if you go to her website, you'll also see some references to short fiction, which has been anthologized. So she's been quite prolific in her writing career so far. And she's able to be a full-time writer now. Previously, she was a corporate trainer. So welcome and congratulations, Silly. And thirdly... Thank you very much. Thanks, Robin. Right. Our pleasure. Thirdly, but by no means last, Sarah. Similarly prolific. She's in here with a, a book which, uh, again, I'll show you, Dead, Dead Man's Track. <laughs> um, she's another person with it very good record of achievement in fiction writing. The um, first effort was called Secrets of Whitewater Creek. That earned her a tot spot in 2014 in the top 10 breakthrough authors, which is a good start. Then she followed that up with a trilogy, the Hunter's Ridge trilogy. Mm -hmm. Then there are two more books. That's and now the one we're looking at. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Okay. And along the way, there were some awards and um, shortlist things and so on as well, I think, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, not to put too fine a point on it, you've done a number of other careers. You've taught vet nursing, horse training. Yes. And magazine editing. That's right. Lots of different things. Anything else you want to admit to? <laughs> no, not right now. <laughs> They're the best of them. Okay. As we tend to say with um, people who front up to tell us about their books with Sisters in Crime, they're frequently, you know, sort of um, multi-talented and underachievers, as we say facetiously. <laughs> it takes a, a very good mind and knowledge of life, I think, to write a, a good crime book. You know, it's not something you write first off easily. Mm -hmm. So we really appreciate this opportunity to pick your brains. I wonder if each of you would 
talk a little about the chief characters in your books. I'll tell you what I noticed about them most. I'm a slacker who stays indoors and keeps warm, but these characters are remarkable. They're outside. The most daunting of conditions. They're extremely active physically. They, if they don't walk, they drive. If they don't get in a helicopter, they're in a boat. They climb mountains. <laughs> <laughs> me absolutely terrified <laughs> which of course sets sets things up then for very good suspenseful paced interesting storylines so i thought my, each of you in turn might tell us about your um chief characters in your books not just one or two as many as you wish and feel free of course to talk to each other too anyone like to go first sure i'll i'll start if you want um Wintering um, is about Jessica, who is a, um, she's a scientist, well, she's, she's finishing her PhD in um, studying glowworms, and she's living in the far south in Tasmania. And the thing with um, Jessica is that she's new to that community. She's been there for um, the four years of doing her research, but she's really been in a cave um, for that entire time doing her field work. Um, or at the university, and she's um, hooked up with a local guy, but she is an outsider in that community. And um, so for Jessica, um, her life changes when her partner, um, and his name is Matthew, and he disappears one day. So his car is found, and he's not with his car. And um, for her, she's basically, a, she, she feels abandoned. She feels like she's in a, um, a place that she's not really familiar with. She doesn't have any friends there. Um, and she's really quite isolated down the bottom of Tasmania in the middle of winter. Um, so for her, that's her journey is to try and find out what actually happened to Matthew. Um, and in the process of working out what happened to Matthew, she kind of finds out what really has been happening to her over the last four years, because um, she really has um, been not looking around and seeing what's going on in her own life. So the major character is Jessica. She is very much isolated. There's another character, William, who um, used to work with um, her partner, Matthew, at the um, fish, at the salmon farm down there. Um, and William is um, someone who she connects with and um, has a friendship with. But um, um, until she meets a group of local women down there, she's pretty much alone. And the local women, um, they, they, uh, I call them the coven because she calls them the coven. Um, they're like a, a group of, um, you know, witches really in a way. They've all been, um, they've all lost their partners. Their partners have been missing um, and they're all living alone and they come together because they think that something has happened to their partners and they think that it's something supernatural. They think that the um, Tasmanian tiger has taken them and that they will return and they'll be changed. So um, for Jessica, a woman of science, there's this um, strange connection with these women who come and surround her and bring her into their fold, um, but who are telling her these strange tales that she doesn't want to believe. So that's really the, the setup for the story, I think. <laughs> They come with guns too. Oh, look, these <laughs> the women down there are really yeah. tough, I can tell you. They know how to chop their wood. They know how to survive yeah. the winter, grow their own food, fish. And Jessica fishes as well. So she's yeah. a, definitely a, a tough fisherwoman. So, you know, she's, she's a scientist, but she also really enjoys uh, um, the outdoors. She enjoys providing for herself and she can shoot a gun. That's true. Mm. <laughs> It was Marlowe territory, wasn't it? You know, yeah. out of a plot, come, two people come through the door with guns. Yeah. <laughs> mm, thank you. Yeah. Well, I'll go next. Oh, okay. Uh, you want, uh, um, Charlotte Pass is a crime novel. It's a blend of, uh, it's a mystery. It's a bit of a mix. It's a whodunit. It's a police procedural with romantic elements. It's set in the historic um, village of Charlotte Pass um, up in the Australian uh, snowy mountains. Um, it's a cold case investigation um, where a, a young woman disappears in 1964 during the um, biggest and longest uh, dump of snow in Australian alpine history. Um, my main characters are a Sydney homicide detective from Parramatta, um, Detective Sergeant Pierce Ryder of the Sydney Homicide Squad and Vanessa Bell, a ski patroller at Charlotte Pass. Um, just 
going on from Chrissy, I guess, um, talking about women. Um, Vanessa is very capable as well. She's, uh, she's a great skier. She's off the farm. She is one day going to take over that family farm. And so at the moment, or not just at the moment, but probably about the last 15 years, she's been living her best life. She's been um, following the snow, uh, going to the Northern Hemisphere, coming back to the Southern Hemisphere, living that itinerant life of having a great, a great time before she takes over the family farm and uh, realises she knows and her parents know that once she's done that, she well, really won't get much of a time to get away. So they're very intent on letting her have this time, I guess, or not letting her have this time, but they're, they're in agreement that she will have this time because she loves the farm as well. So in the meantime, she's working as a ski patroller. And for non-skiers, I guess ski patrollers are um, it's sort of like the unofficial police of the snow. Um, other than the mountain manager, they probably have the most um, power out there on the hill. And they're responsible for um, making sure that the mountain is safe for skiers and boarders. So they go out in the morning and they check the terrain. They rope off any haz hazards like rocks and trees. Um, they make sure all the lifts are working properly. Um, they close off any trails that may have be become dangerous. Um, and when they're out there working day to day, they uh, um, look after any injured people on the mountain, they uh, minister first aid to them, they bring them down the mountain safely for medical attention. They're usually the first out on the mountain and the last to go in. So in the evening, what they do after everybody, the lifts are closed, um, they still get on the lifts and go up and they're looking, do, uh, doing what you call a sweep. So they're, they're looking from side to side at the slopes and making sure that no one's out there injured or can't get in. Um, they go up, they ski down, doing the same thing, just making sure that everybody's inside and everybody's safe. Um, they can also confiscate uh, ski passes if they think that somebody is um, uh, not abiding by the, the mountain's code of conduct um, and all of that. So I guess in, in that way, apart from the mountain manager, they are the um, unofficial police on the hills. So that is um, my main uh, character, or one of my main characters. Uh, Detective Sergeant Pierce Ryder goes down there to investigate a cold case. And he has come with a trauma of his own, has certain issues, and he get, he depends on Vanessa to show him around the mountain because she is so familiar with the terrain and everything. So while she can't help him with the investigation, she can... Um, she, you know, she can get him up to where he needs to go, where she's found the bones and the cold case goes from there of the missing girl. Cold case. <laughs> yes, a cold yes. case in a cold climate. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh dear. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sarah? Uh, well, Deborah's track is a thriller set in Tasmania, predominantly around Hobart in the Southwest National Park. Uh, it's really a story of three people living very different lives and they're thrown together by a tragic accident, a terrible crime and an unknown threat. Um, Tess grew up on a cattle property and a tourist retreat in the central highlands of Tasmania. Uh, she's raised by parents that were also raised there and they teach her very early to respect the climate and conditions and this is the lifestyle that she's known her whole life. She doesn't really know anything else. Her entire sense of self in one way or another is, is tied up in the wilderness and her abilities as a guide and a search and rescue volunteer. Um, the youngest of my main characters, Jai, he, he's a really interesting young man. He wants to be strong. He has a really good heart, but he's barely out of his teens and he's dealing with a situation um, more mature people would struggle with. So he makes some bad choices, but he makes them with the best of intentions. Um, and my detective, who's um, in charge of uh, figuring out what's going on between robberies and murders and trying to link it all together, is Jared. And he, um, he's a more straightforward character, I think. He believes wholeheartedly in the law, but he's able to see shades of grey. Um, he's certainly not as comfortable with the harshness of the Tassie wilderness as Tess is, but 
when it comes down to it, he's more than willing to drop himself into it in order to track down the killer. Yes, they drop themselves in quite literally, don't they? Look, quite literally, yes. <laughs> Very long escarpments and things happening. Yes, it's a remarkable story. Thank you. We might learn later whether you've actually done some of those things or what, where you've been. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Time yeah. I wanted then maybe to go to a more conceptual, thematic sort of question, so we'll go a little deeper into the stories. One thing I noticed reading all three was the contrast was protection, which was absolutely essential in those environments. We want to protect people, we want to be protected, we need to. Uh, at the other end, I don't know if it's a spectrum, but I also noticed abuse happening, relationships, power too strong, how, you know, pressuring people or manipulating them, taking things in the wrong direction where it might be masquerading as uh, protection, for example, but certainly doesn't come out that way in the end. So I wondered if each of you could speak to those um, contrasts within the text. Anyone? Uh, it's really important, I think, especially I'm, I'm sure that um, Sarah will know this from her research in Tasmania. Um, you and, and also probably Lee with your um, I don't know the Blue Mountains as, as well. But um, I've certainly spent a lot of time in Tasmania. And I know that if you don't, um, if you don't know how to protect yourself, if you don't know how to chop your wood, if you don't have a fire that's going to get you through, you're not you really are going to die reasonably quickly. So I think that that idea of, um, of protection is, you know, it's a really important thing because it's so easy to, um, to freeze to death. You know, that's, that's something that's going to kill you quicker than, you know, starving, that's for sure. And so um, I think that that's a really important thing um, to think about when you're writing a book set in one of those cold climates is that, um, you know, every second counts in the cold. Um, and that protecting yourself and, and having the right gear to get you through the winter is absolutely fundamentally important. Um, and of course, if there's someone in your own life who is um, not um, on board with that protection, it's really easy for you to be open to um, uh, open to abuse in in many different ways. It's really easy to kind of um, cause you harm in those circumstances because it's a simple matter of locking you outside, you know, you don't need a gun. You can lock someone outside <laughs> and they're going to die. Um, so the, yeah. the people that you choose to live with are really important to you and to know that you can trust those people. And, um, and I think that that's, that's definitely the tension in my book because I know that I was looking at um, issues of domestic violence and, I mean, we've all gone through um, a bit of, you know, COVID lockdown and people have talked about the rise in domestic violence and the fact that if you're, if you're locked down with somebody who is not you know, stable or not to be trusted, you are in a really vulnerable and dangerous position and particularly in winter in mm -hmm. those kind of cold climates. Yes, it's, it's absolutely elemental, really, the survival in these books, isn't it? rather than not just psychological. Yes. Not just psychological, <laughs> yes. Yeah. What did the others find? Like, yeah, I noticed, um, you know, sort of those common themes throughout the throughout the stories, um, the um, domestic abuse and, and fleeing from, uh, in my case, um, someone fleeing from from that that kind of thing. Um, also, uh, just you know, with the, um, Sarah's story of Tess, it was sort of a a um, like a a growing emotional. Uh, abuse I guess there an emotional control that sort of grew over time and and, and that and uh, I also thought that um, you know it is very um, uh, harsh terrain um, in the alpine areas and um, yes people are very vulnerable if in those situations and uh, they're desperate if they make a if someone makes a run for their life or um, something like that. They, um, you know, they're out there in in the wild. And and my story is about a cold case uh, of a woman that they think has wandered off um, during a snow a snowstorm, and it's a missing persons investigation um, that turns into a murder when her her body has been discovered. So yeah, I, I just think that misuse of power and the power differential um, uh, uh, difference between characters and that, I, I could see that in all of the whole three of the novels. Yeah, so mm -hmm. there's something in the zeitgeist at present that brought these into the novel or was it to do um, with the environment? Yeah, well, I, 
Well, I just think, um, well, from my point of view, I think it is in the current um, climate. I mean, we, we see a woman die every um, week of domestic abuse in Australia. We just had one up here um, in the Hunter Valley this week, this last week, mm -hmm. and uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, getting any better. It seems to be getting worse. And, um, and I think it's always happened, but it, it is um, during this pandemic, they, as you said, they were speaking about it. So I think, these, I think it's important, um, you know, it gives, um, uh, you know, everyone can, can learn from fiction novels um, as well of, of how people might find strength to handle those situations. Um, they might read a book and think, you know, that, that situation is happening to me or that emotional abuse is happening to me and, and how that character may um, um, handle that and find the strength to do something. Uh, I, yeah, I think there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's basis for, for using them, using them. Yes, mm. yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Particularly, yes, Sarah's perhaps is the most blatant case of at that controlling end of the spectrum, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I Yes, absolutely. And, you know, one element of, of the story, um, it does deal very much with domestic violence, but like Lee said, it is a really prominent discussion that we're having as a society right now. And you hear the horrific stories in the news, um, but of course, you know, it's not necessarily always the physical and it, it mm. is the way that it really insidiously creeps little by little into a relationship. And, and it can leave the victim questioning themselves and their actions rather than those of the abuser. And then, you know, that, that's where the cycle begins. Um, and I, I was really interested in that in Deadman's track. Um, Tess's confidence is shattered after the accident that she's involved in and her partner uses that experience to undermine her confidence further and, and gradually assert more and more control over her life. Um, in a very real way, this becomes as challenging a hurdle for her to overcome as the memory of the accident itself and equally as dangerous. Uh, I, again, like I said, I did lots of research, but... You know, at one point, one of my editors said to me, do we really have to go there? Like, can you not just give up? And I had to say no, because they don't. In way too many cases, they just don't stop. Um, yeah. So I just thought it was important to sort of to see that through. Yes, I didn't know how you were going to resolve that. And it took a while, didn't it? Yes. Mm. It's a cliche to say, of course, that the landscape is a character, but landscape does tend to be, in your books, very strong. And protection of landscape is also a factor, particularly in Sarah's, perhaps. But does anyone want to comment on that? Oh, protection of the landscape is very important yeah. down in the Snowy Mountains as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the National Parks and Wildlife do have um, very strict controls on what uh, can be used, um, what the terrain can be used for. And, uh, um, and yeah, the... the, the landscape does become a character in, it, in itself, I think. But uh, yes, we need to protect this heritage, cultural um, uh, sites and things up at, the, uh, up at the Snowy Mountains. And I think it is it, it's very important to, to bring that to the fore as well. So whether it's the, you know, the hi one hibernating um, little pygmy possum up there, which I think, believe is the only hibernating um, animal in Australia, um, whatever it is, or just the, yeah. just the landscape. Um, which is, you know, millions of years old uh, that has to be has to be protected. And I, some of that comes out in my, my story, I think, you know, when I talk about the ill-fated chairlift um, and the army going in and, um, and shooting up the pylons of, the, of this um, old chairlift that did exist. And uh, I think that's really important because, um, say, the army, for instance, they do have to train out in that terrain um, to, you know, prepare themselves to go um, over to Afghanistan and, and mm. areas that are mountainous and freezing and everything. Um, and so that's a fine line, too. Well, the National Parks and Wildlife um, realise that they have to train out there, that it's necessary. Mm. But again, they have to have that respect for, um, for the landscape. Mm. Yes, they're very multi-layered books in this respect. Um, Sarah, on your aspect, how do you regard the landscape in your book, the protection of it particularly? Well, it's t Tasmania is just the most incredible place. I, I probably love it more than anywhere else on earth. So yeah. seeing, trying to have a balanced perspective between people and industry and livelihoods and protecting you know, what is in so many ways unique. 
um, it's it's a difficult one for me because I, I'm sort of leaning towards the side of saying we need to protect it. We can't have logging. We can't we can't be, you know, pulling out two, three, four hundred year old trees. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I try and say, well, you know, there are people down there that have been there for generations, relying on these industries to survive, and somehow, surely, we've got to be able to come to some arrangement where we can we can be on both sides and and protect you know what's so really precious down there yes and then the setting fire to things or not using fire all those sort of details are, are yes. Really awful. yes absolutely yeah. it takes us directly to chrissy in the sense because his primary industries are in your book strongly so what do you think well i think um well jessica's a scientist and her major um thing is is these glowworms which are incredibly flat fragile ecosystems and so in a way that her glowworm cave is um like a microcosm of um the way we need to treat the environment because those glowworms can only operate if there's no interference um in that kind of environment if there's no human interference you know human touching the rocks or breathing will um, affect that environment. And so that tiny little microcosm um, of that glowworm cave is kind of, um, it's like the canary in the coal mine of what's going on down in Tasmania as well. I, I, and what's going on globally. I think, you know, we, we, we do need to be mindful of people and, and jobs and stuff. But as we've, as, as we've realized with the pandemic that we've got on at the moment, you know, we, I think human life and the life of the planet is more important than um, than the kind of economy, which is like a false system of barter that we have, you know, in the capitalist um, system. I, I think that that's it's not it's not the only way to do things, and I think that we need to find other ways because you know this is just the tip of the iceberg um, when we start to really feel the pinch of climate change. And we did just before our lockdown, we were looking at these fires which mm. devastated you know vast areas of our country, and even the year before this, um, so two years ago. I was in a situation where my father, who lives in Tasmania, just where my book is set, um, was in the middle of the fires that were happening down there, burning these old wood, you know, forests, these old growth forests. And my mother was up in Queensland, threatened by fires that were happening mm. up there. And it just made me think, you know, what are we doing? We can't, mm. you know, we can't sit around and, and talk about money when actually we are, are our, our safety and the safety of our planet is much more important. And I think that's an underlying theme in the book as well, because she's very aware as she's down in that area, she's very aware that she's on Aboriginal land. Uh, she's very aware that there are mm. stories that she doesn't know and that she's mm. an outsider in this land and that probably um, there are people who are better at protecting that environment than, you know, than white people are. Um, and I think that that's, that's simmering at the base of the book and it's simmering at the base of, our lives, I think, really. Mm. There's a lot more we could say on that. <laughs> but well, I think our last question was a different one I devised, was something about genre. Um, the writing of your books, what it took you to get to that point of having maybe that complete first draft, um, what considerations were important to you, for example, were you placing it as a piece of a certain genre or were you more interested in the activity of the plot? What, what was going through your head and fingertips as you worked? Well, for me, um, it was just the story that I had been hoping to write for a long, long time. My first novel was set in Charlotte Pass. Um, it's in the bottom drawer. I wrote a, a YA set in Charlotte Pass. Oh, okay. it's, also, <laughs> it's also in the bottom drawer. Um, so I just felt with when I was writing it that, um, that this was the book that I had been meant to write and that all the other lead up books had were sort of almost grooming me to write this particular book but I think it took me 25 years to get to know the landscape <laughs> no I don't mean, it didn't take me 25 years to write this story um, it, did, it did in a way you know. it did in a way but I wasn't um I wasn't ready to write to the book back then because it wasn't a landscape when I went first went down to Charlotte Pass 25 years ago. I didn't know the people. I didn't know the, the culture, um, the culture of the itinerant workers, um, you know, the ones that had moved out of the mainstream, I guess, down there. Um, so over the years, I got to um, know these people. Um, my daughter became a ski instructor down there for um, a number of years. 
and uh, and I, it, I guess after 25 years, I was ready to write this book. Um, as I uh, researched more, found out about the ill-fated chairlift and what had gone on back in 1964 and what was behind all of that, um, then I knew that I, I wanted to craft a novel where I could isolate um, a, a mountain village. And I think that's the unique thing about Charlotte Pass is that it is a, a small village that can, can be completely isolated and you can only get in and out by snowcat or on a snowmobile. Um, and even on a snowcat, it can take 40 minutes to get in from Perigee wow. Terminal. Mm -hmm. So when something happens in there, I thought it was the best um, uh, setting to to, to write a novel um, where you just couldn't get out, um, physically could not get out of this, of this village. So um, yeah, all of those aspects came, came together for me with, the, with this chairlift. It's a very little known piece of infrastructure um, that has, has built up there on the roof of Australia and that mm. not that many people um, know about. And, uh, and so it was a way of sort of telling the story of the chairlift, um, but in a way that, you know, also embraced the landscape and I crafted the characters as well as I could for the mystery. Wow. So that, that was how mine all came together, I guess. <laughs> And you created a cosy mystery, like Agatha Christie style. That's right, that's right. Yes, yes, yes. So, yeah. yes. Good way to start your career yeah. writing. Well, <laughs> well, thank, well, thank, yeah. Thanks for that. And I love the fact yeah. that they all came together as in an Agatha Christie novel. Yes. That they did all come together where the scene of the crime, where it happened originally, and then they were all back in that same place. Yes, again. 50 so years later. Like, yeah, very it clever. Those, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah aspects of, of that, the, the way Christy used to do that. You know, yes. I, oh, thank you. <laughs> I thought it was beautifully patterned. It was very clever. Thank you. And I also had a bit of, Sarah, um, yes. Agatha Christie echoes there, I thought. <laughs> Picking people off, but one by one, yes. Yeah, or is that, or is that more modern movies? And uh, you know, <laughs> uh, it, you know, I didn't really have that idea in my head when I started. I just oh, okay. find it. Um, it all started with Tasmania, really. That that rather than a character or a particular plot, I thought I I need to write a series of books in Tassie because I've just been so inspired by the landscape and the history, um, and I love anything rural, crime and or thrillers so to be able to combine those in this setting I just found that that was a wonderful thing to be able to do so um, in terms of landscape I mean the national parks some of the most beautiful terrain on earth but also incredibly volatile and dangerous um, so I was lucky enough to be able to consult on the book with the head of the southern region SES um, mm. search and rescue and just learning about what they do and the sort of training they have to undergo so much respect and admiration for these people. And I thought, well, you know, I want to write about that too. And um, that's really where Tess's character evolved, um, well, she evolved into, because previously in the other book she, she hadn't had that experience. So she had to come and step up uh, to fill those shoes so that I could sort of portray what these people do every day, because it's incredible. Yes, it was, yeah. It's hero mm. stuff, isn't it? Truly, it really yeah, is. It really is. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been down there. And I've I've seen a lot of these these places, and I can't imagine no. climbing those mountains. Um, you know, trudging for that two week period in the middle of winter through some of that terrain. Yeah. So, really, really amazing. Yes, you had me with you, but <laughs> only in spirit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Chrissy, um, yeah. Yeah, I was. I was writing a different book when um, this book came knocking at the door, really. I was down in Tasmania. Tasmania. A friend of mine um, has a shack right down on the beach at, Shou at Southport um, and no one uses it in winter because you'd be crazy to use it in winter. Um, but, of course, it's a perfect writing place. And so I went down to um, try and really focus on this book, which had been um, hard to finish. And um, so while I was down there, uh, I was writing this other book set in, set in Queensland mm -hmm. and I kept, we had a big storm and um, it was just, the landscape itself was just really too affecting for me to um, 
to do anything else. And so I had to, I was so distracted by what was going on outside the shack that I had to put the book away that I was supposed to be writing on and write these scenes, which um, were really about what was going on outside the shack, the, the storms and the fact that I was really um, frightened every time we mm. went through this particular patch of road through um, old growth logging kind of areas that um, you just couldn't get any reception. And um, it was so cold and windy and rainy that I just, every time I went through it, I wondered what would happen if your car broke down here, you know, mm. and it's quite um, frightening at night when you hear, um, you know, the, the things on the side of this tiny little tin shack, you know, this fibro yes. shack with a tin yes. roof. Um, and, and, at one point, our um, the rain was so intense that it came down the tiny little chimney and put and wet all the um, the logs that were there. It was, it, mm. and we couldn't get them started. So mm. basically, you had to basically be in bed um, with the electric blanket mm. on because you know you just couldn't get up. Except you had electricity. <laughs> yeah, well, there was you electricity. Had a generator. <laughs> there was electricity, which was amazing. And at one mm. point, the electricity did go out, but yes. that was that was before the the wet logs. But but, you know, it was that it was really that landscape that led me to think about what would happen if someone disappeared on that road. Um, mm -hmm. And when I started writing the book, it just came out so quickly. It was like it was desperate to be written. Um, and I had a book um, with me. I had Shirley Jackson's. Um, they, um, they will always live in the castle. I think it's called. They must all, um, mm, Shirley yeah. Williams. No, Shirley, Jack, Jack, Shirley Jackson. 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 Yes, yes. Yeah. And that's a, mm. it's kind of a creepy thriller yes. Um, yes. in its own right, a classic. And I was reading that as well. And that really um, impacted, I think, on the feel of the book and the, the kind of otherworldliness of the book because her books have this. this oh, they're harsh, aren't they? They're, yeah, yeah, this little yeah. edge to the other world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that was impacting me as well. And it, it was just one of those books that just had to leap out before I could move on. And so that's where so the book creepy. came from. Yeah, it's a, it's a creepy little place down there. I love it. It's, yeah. Again, it's my, it's my heart place. Um, you know, yeah. my father lives there and I go fishing there all the time. So there was a lot of time on the water to write mm. about. But, um, yeah, it's, it's also a sort of place where if something goes wrong, it will go terribly wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I got that. And yours is, I thought, sort of a fable. You could say it's a fable if you wanted or a fairy tale or... Yeah, well, there's a it's kind of an edge of kind of a, a monster kind of um, mm. a monstrousness. So there's an there's an edge of um, of yeah, I suppose the the, the um, Hansel and Gretel kind of mm. edge too. That idea of being lost in the woods and um, is there a is there a creature out there? You know, um, it's all that metaphysical stuff. You've got the possibilities of hybridity of human yes. animals and so yeah. on. Mm. And I really had to wrestle with that because I didn't want to be writing a book that was completely, um, you know, in that realm of the fantastic. But I wanted to tread this line where it could all be in the real world. But also the idea that if you're living with somebody who you can't, who can't be trusted, if you're living with an abuser, you are living with a monster as well. Yes, that came, yes. That people mm. are monstrous. Yes. And that, that was that monster story needed to be told from that perspective too. So there was lots of, lots of little things to clip together before it actually mm. came together as a book. But um, yeah, it certainly, it certainly found me. I didn't go looking for this book. It, it knocked on my door. Right. As always with Sisters in Crime events, we love to give away books because our whole mission is celebrating writing, not necessarily in book form, but writing about crime by women in Australia and elsewhere. So we have three stacks of books, which include the books by our authors tonight. And our authors are going to pick lucky numbers. We're going to pick in each case, a number between 1 and 37, and then those will tally up with some names of people who have registered and made a connection to us for the first broadcast. So we'll get those three numbers. Uh, Chrissy? 23. Okay, thank you. Lee? 12. 12. Sarah? 9. 9. Okay. Well, those lucky persons will be getting stacks of books in that mail, <laughs> despite COVID. And we might work, put their name on our website so that people will know that they actually do have names attached to those numbers. And now I'll just make a couple of closing announcements. Um, our next panel, which will be Zoomed in the similar way, happens in one month's time. Three authors and international women of mystery is the theme. And again, this will be a recording where people will be able to um, watch 
close to the date and then follow it through on YouTube if they want to at a later date. Um, also, of course, if you wish to hook up with other um, Sisters in Crime events, you can go to the website at any time and there's a email sent out once a month at the end of the month, which has lots of info. And there's all the social media, Facebook, Twitter and Insta. Um, and other events, no doubt there are some. Yes, one other thing to suggest, if you do go to YouTube, Murder Mondays. These are short interviews with authors, international and local. They go for just between about 15 and 20 minutes and they talk about the craft of writing. So they're well worth catching because they don't, um, they're not arduous, they don't take too long to watch and they're good fun. So I suggest that you do follow our developments on YouTube. It's new to us this year, but we're getting better and better and doing more and more. I know Christy, you've also been doing quite a bit on YouTube, haven't you, for book sales? Yeah, lots of Zoom events. Lots yes, Zoom events. yes. <laughs> we're getting close to overload, so <laughs> we're trying to refine them, get ourselves the best we can. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to our authors. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Robin. Robin. Thanks very thank much. Thank you to our facilitators Thanks. and thank you to our audience. Good night. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. See ya.